Hey everybody, so we're going to dig into VCV Rack and look at some of the fundamentals of sound and sound synthesis. Uh, so if you haven't already done the VCV Rack setup tutorial that I posted to YouTube, you should do that. And also the one thing that was missing from that uh, tutorial was that the record plugin is not by default installed with VCV Rack, even though it's a plugin created by VCV. So you need to go to library, manage plugins. That's going to call up your browser, take you to the library.vcvrack.com page, and under brand, select VCV. And you'll see that you can individually subscribe to the VCV recorder. Right here, subscribe to recorder. Log in if you're not already logged in. And you'll see that you're subscribed when this is in blue and says unsubscribe from recorder. And then you'll be able to, when you right click and choose VCV, you'll be able to choose the recorder here. And it'll place it into your rack. Now sometimes when you do that, it places it into an odd spot in your rack. One thing you should realize is your rack here is really quite big. If you go to view zoom, you can zoom out and see a lot of rack space here. So I leave it zoomed in pretty far just to make the tutorial more viewable, but you can work at whatever zoom rate you're comfortable with and take up as much screen landscape as you want. So let's take a look at some fundamental concepts here. I'm going to delete a lot of stuff out of this. I'm going to delete the notes. I'm going to delete the ADSR, the VCF, the VCO, the MIDI CV, and the recorder for the moment. And I'm going to create an LFO. So I'm going to use the VCV filter here. And into the box, I'll type LFO. And I'm going to choose LFO1. LFO stands for Low Frequency Oscillator because sound is fundamentally oscillation. A sound is an oscillation of air molecules. And when those oscillating air molecules hit the diaphragm of a microphone, they cause that diaphragm to oscillate, which generates an oscillating voltage that then is either connected to an amplifier if the microphone is amplifying sound or is connected to an analog to digital converter if it's being converted into numbers and recorded. When that sound then goes to an amplifier, that oscillating voltage is amplified, increased, made larger, and sent to an electromagnet, which then causes a speaker cone, which is a piece of paper attached to an electromagnet, to oscillate, which again shakes the air molecules. And then when those oscillating air molecules hit our eardrum, our eardrum oscillates. So all sound in all of its various forms is oscillation. And here we have a low frequency oscillator, which is an electronic device that creates oscillation. So it creates sounds. But the reason I'm using a low frequency oscillator is I want to show you how sounds that are below a certain frequency are not audible and how these inaudible sounds or sounds that are heard only as rhythm turn into pitched sounds or tones. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to disconnect the output of the mixer that's going to the scope. And instead, I'm going to take the sine wave output of my LFO and connect it to the X input of the scope. And I'm going to switch this from uni, which means greater than zero, to bi, which means an oscillation that goes above zero and then below zero. I'm also going to click the inlet of this mixer connect it also to the sign, turn down my mixer level to about 25%, and the mix output is already connected to my output device. Make sure I can select an output device that I can hear. Right now I'm using the external headphones. So here we have a sine wave oscillating, and if we right-click the frequency knob, we can see it's oscillating at 2 hertz, or that's 2 times per second. So Obviously, when you move something twice a second, it doesn't make a sound. If I were to wave my hand in the air twice per second, it's not going to make a noise. But at a certain point, if I wave my hand in the air fast enough, I'm going to be shaking 
the air molecules fast enough that we'll begin to hear that as a sound, as an audible oscillation. So let's listen to that. I'm going to click on this frequency knob and turn it up. Hear that? You should be hearing a bass tone by the time we reach about 46 hertz, 46 times per second. What we're hearing is the movement of air back and forth in this sinusoidal pattern 46 times a second. And the faster this oscillation happens, the higher the pitch of the sound will be. So now you should be hearing quite a steady tone. That's 134 oscillations per second, cycles per second. There's 269 cycles per second. There's 686 cycles per second. If you're a musician, you'll know that when we tune, we typically tune to 440 cycles per second, which is A above middle C, which is that note right there, 440 hertz. And I'm right-clicking here so that I can see my frequency and type it in. And if I zoom out with my time here, I can see that this is still a sinusoidal wave. This is still a smoothly oscillating up and down wave. It's the same shape as the inaudible wave. Now because this is a low frequency oscillator, it doesn't actually go very high. It maxes out at 1024 hertz. Which is fine. We don't right now need to generate sounds higher than that because we're just looking at the principle. But the human ear hears up to about 16,000 hertz. Um, and some human ears will hear higher frequencies than that. So let's take a look at a different waveform. This is a sinusoidal waveform. And when it goes into the audible range, we hear it as a very pure tone. We can also create a triangular waveform which again is inaudible at low frequencies. Right now we're at 4.25 hertz, about four times per second. But as we increase it, we'll begin to hear it as a tone, but it's going to be a different quality of sound. Why? Because we're going to be moving the speaker cone on our headphones in a triangular shape rather than a sinusoidal or circular shape. And the triangular wave is a more complex waveform which produces what we call richer harmonics or richer secondary frequencies above the fundamental frequency. So while a sine wave just gives us the frequency that we're dialing in here, 57 hertz, a triangle wave at the same frequency is giving us not only 57 hertz, but also what we call harmonics, or frequencies above the fundamental. And those frequencies are what give the sound its color. Now let's take a very different case here, the sawtooth wave. Because as soon as we switch to the sawtooth wave, we're going to hear something. Right, you hear a clicking. What is that clicking? That is when the speaker cone position snaps from this positive value down to this negative value. So you recognize that as the same source of pops and clicks that we were fixing in the first class by making sure that when we made an edit there wasn't a discontinuous jump across zero. Right? Right now we're getting an intentional discontinuous jump across zero every time this sawtooth wave jumps back down to its negative position. It crosses zero instantaneously, and that snap of the speaker cone is what we hear as a click. But, again, as we increase the frequency of this, 
we're no longer going to hear it as a click. We're going to hear it as a tone, and we're going to hear it as a richer tone, a richer even tone than the triangle wave. And also there it becomes very clear the transition point between rhythm and pitch. Anything that's a rhythm, if we increase the frequency sufficiently, will cross a certain threshold where we no longer perceive it as a rhythm and we begin to perceive it as a pitch. For me it's right about there. That to me is no longer a really fast rhythm, it's actually a note. And for you it might be a little bit different. It's more of a psychological principle than a physical principle. Finally, we'll take a look at the square wave. The square wave is actually only made of pops. It's only made of instantaneous transitions, where the speaker cone is moving from a positive value across a zero to a negative value. So it's just a series of rhythmic clicks. But again, when we speed it up, it gives us a very, very rich timbre full of overtones. So as I mentioned, I'll turn down the level of the mixer here so we don't have that clicking sound. As I mentioned, um, the LFO is not usually used to generate frequencies that we hear. It's for generating low frequencies. But there's uh, another object called the VCO, or the Voltage Controlled Oscillator, and that has a much, much higher range. And we can see it's laid out almost identically to the LFO, but when we connect the VCO, we'll hear that it's capable of much higher frequencies. In fact, its default frequency is 261 and it goes up to 6,000 hertz. And it doesn't go all the way down to the threshold of silence. So why do we have low frequency oscillators and voltage controlled oscillators? What's the difference? Well, as far as the computer is concerned, there isn't really a difference. There's no reason why one module couldn't do both of these functions. But historically, uh, since this VCV rack is modeling old analog synthesizer circuits of the 1960s and 70s, at that time, your low-frequency circuits and your high-frequency circuits had a different internal structure. So because of that historical reason, we still have LFOs and VCOs. So what can we do in the relationship between an LFO and a VCO? And this brings us to the next concept, which is the concept of modulation. So I can use the LFO to modulate some aspect of the sound. Modulate just means to change. So I'm going to create another scope here. I'll copy the scope and paste it over here. I'm going to hook the sign output of my LFO up to the scope, and I'm going to put this LFO back in unipolar mode, so it's just generating positive values. And you see here, there's a CV input on my mixer. That stands for control voltage. So I'm going to use my LFO to control the mixer with this varying voltage. So I'm going to click the CV1 input and attach it to the sine wave output of the LFO and turn my sound back up. Right, so I've got my LFO, but the shape of my LFO is controlling the volume of the VCO. And this is called amplitude modulation. Basically, that translates to changing loudness. So listen to some of the different effects I can get from that. 
So already I'm able to create a pretty broad range of sounds. And amplitude modulation synthesis is one of the simplest forms of synthesis, where simply rapidly turning up and down the volume of one sound creates additional harmonics. We could also use this same technique to create rhythms. For instance, if I change to a square wave here, slow it down, that will simply be turning on and off my VCO. But modulation doesn't have to be amplitude modulation. There's also frequency modulation, which is where something like an LFO changes the frequency or the pitch of the VCO. So here I'm going to switch back to a triangle waveform, plug that triangle waveform into the volt per octave input of the VCO, and we'll hear this waveform do frequency modulation on the VCO. Now here, of course, it's sweeping through a huge range, and we may not want that large range, so we can change the amount of modulation that's being applied to the voltage-controlled oscillator by adding the 8-vert module, which is an attenuator, which will allow us to turn things down. So we'll take the triangle wave output of the LFO, pass it into the 8-vert, We'll take the output of the 8-vert, look at it here. We'll take the volt per octave input of the VCO and connect it to the output of the 8-vert. And by default, this inlet is set to zero, so it's taking our LFO and turning it all the way down. As we increase this, we'll see that we can change the amplitude of our LFO. And this will, in turn, change the amount, the range of frequency modulation being done on our VCO. So what we have here is a triangle wave LFO changing the frequency of a square wave VCO and we're using the 8 vert to reduce the height or reduce the amplitude of the LFO wave so that the effect on the pitch is smaller. So before I go further with discussion of modulation, you may have noticed that the sounds that we're generating are kind of harsh and brittle and annoying, and that's because we haven't put a VCF in play yet, and you've already seen the VCF in action during the setup. So I've made a little more space here, I've zoomed out, just so we can drag my scopes down onto a lower level and just clear some space here. Uh, and I'm going to add a VCF after the VCO. VCF, voltage controlled filter. And I'm going to put the VCF in line between the VCO and the mixer and I'm going to use the low pass filter output. And now let's hear uh, what the VCF can do to our sound, how it can shape and color it. So by cutting out the high frequencies in the sound and selectively amplifying the sound at the cutoff frequency, we're able to change a lot of character of the sound. So now that we've got a sound that's a little bit easier to listen to, let's take a look at some more modulation possibilities. So there's several things we can do. One thing we can do is we can mix modulators together. And for that, and this is our last new module of the day, we're going to look at 
the Unity module. And the Unity module just mixes things together and sends them out. So, for instance, instead of having a single LFO affecting the frequency of VCO1, I can copy it, paste it, and have two LFOs mix together to modulate the frequency. And I can set the LFOs to different frequencies so that we get, and you can see it here, we get a more unusual, unpredictable waveform because it's the combination of a sine wave and a triangle wave at different frequencies. I can also have one low frequency oscillator modulate the rate of another low frequency oscillator. So let's try that. Um, I'll put in an amplitude modulation LFO here. Copy this LFO, paste it in, and I will take the square wave output and pass it into the CV control of my mixer. Let me reorganize this so it's a bit redder, a bit easier to read. Add a new scope for this one. Take a listen. So I'll add a second LFO that mod modulates the speed of this first LFO. So we can see what's happening here is this LFO is changing the speed of this LFO. As the sine wave output of the first LFO goes up and down, it's modulating the speed of the second LFO, and the amount of modulation is controlled here in frequency modulation 1 CV. And so all of these things are happening, all of these layers are happening at the same time. We have a modulator modulating a modulator that's modulating amplitude here. We have two modulators being mixed to modulate frequency here, and there's really no bottom to it. Now we can add another modulator to modulate the voltage-controlled filter. So now what we have is this LFO here. The sawtooth output is modulating the frequency of the voltage-controlled filter in this frequency CV. It's determining how much modulation is being applied. So your range of sonic possibilities is really, really huge. And of course, we've only begun to scratch the surface. This is uh, a very first small exploration into synthesis.
So this is the kind of synthesizer that you're going to be designing as homework this week, something that creates a sound environment using the tools that I showed you. You don't use, need to use anything in addition to the tools that we went over in this tutorial, but try to pursue some interesting sounds that you think you could actually use in a sound design for some type of audio storytelling, or alternatively, find some sounds that you feel like tell a story in themselves, some sounds that have a character, have a direction, seem to have a motivation, seem to have a quality of aliveness to them. And uh, I'll show you a couple of the things that are in this that give this sound some of its unpredictability and some of its character. But before we do, I want to show you how to save the work for this week. We're not going to make recordings of these, rather we're going to save the entire patch. So go to File, Save As, name your patch, be mindful of where you're saving it, save that, and you're going to upload a compressed zip folder of patches made in VCV Rack. So let's take a look at what's happening. First of all, there's three simultaneous synthesizers. They're all being mixed together here at the mixer. So one synthesizer is right here in the upper left corner. It's a VCO feeding a VCF with an LFO controlling the frequency of the VCF. And we can see the output of the LFO here on the scope and also here the way in which it's sweeping the cutoff frequency of the filter. very unpredictable waveform, and we'll get to why that is in a moment. Down here, there's another synthesizer, same structure, VCO, feeding a VCF with an LFO controlling the cutoff frequency of the VCF. We see that it's a very, very slow LFO. If we right-click on it, we'll see that it's 0.04 hertz. That means about once every 25 seconds. And then our third synthesizer is here, which is an LFO controlling the pitch of a VCO. We can see it's passing through the second channel of the 8 vert here. So this LFO is controlling the pitch of this VCO, which is passing through a VCF, and also has an LFO controlling the VCF. And in addition, there's an LFO controlling the volume on the mixer and it's actually the same LFO that's modulating the frequency of this VCF. So very slowly as this gets turned up, so does this. So we're using one LFO to control two different locations. And then here's the thing that's producing this unusual pattern in this LFO. We have a feedback loop happening, and let me explain how that's working. So, this LFO here is not only modulating the frequency of this VCF through this red cable, it's also modulating the frequency of this LFO. And then the output of this LFO is being mixed with this LFO here, and the combined signal of the two LFOs is being passed through the 8 vert and feeding back into one of the LFOs. So you see there's a complete feedback loop here. Output, controlling this LFO, input, back into Unity, mixing together, and then controlling itself. So creating feedback loops is a way to create unpredictability in your patches because the output of this complex system is feeding back into itself to create these unusual patterns and shapes. And you can see here in this LFO, which is in the middle of the feedback loop, it's going through all sorts of permutations from a triangle wave through to something more like a sine wave through a shape that is neither triangle wave nor sine wave. 